It's the fourth most densely populated city in the world. The capital of a fast-growing economy, Delhi's population grows at the rate of 4% every year. To keep pace with the future, Delhi needs to stay on the move. This puts massive pressure on its road networks. A growing demand for innovative methods to better the public transport network had been a constant challenge for the city's administrators. Roads were already packed to maximum capacity, so a new mode of transport would be needed. Today, rising to the challenge, zipping through the nerves of the city and carrying more than 1.5 million passengers every day is the Delhi Metro. The Delhi Metro's success has made everyone ask, how did they do it? A model of efficiency and credibility, its road to success started with an impeccable project design. Today, it is a role model for large-scale developmental projects across sectors throughout the country. Chief Minister of Delhi, Mrs. Sheila Dikshit, has been a witness to and a partner in Delhi Metro's transformational success. The Metro has been like a boon absolutely boon with a big B and a oh, big capital boon because A, it uh, took off uh, uh, people from off the streets, they had to travel by bus or by cycle or by taxi or by their own vehicles and all. Uh, so I shudder to think that if the metro had not been there, what would be the condition of Delhi uh, because it's a highly density, uh, what, how would people commute, how would students commute, how would the older people commute. So it's been a great experience and it's been a, a learning experience for the people of Delhi. They feel a great pride in the metro. DMRC is a unique project. Its inception, a story of administrative excellence partnered with political will, all in the interest of the public good. Which are the key ingredients that made all the difference? Delhi Metro's unique work culture, its decision-making processes, and the leadership of Mr. E. Sridhar. In the early 90s, there were more vehicles on Delhi's roads than Mumbai, Kolkata, and Chennai put together. Delhi was packed to capacity and growing every day. Then additional secretary in the Department of Urban Development, Mr. N.P. Singh, found himself at the very centre of a challenging problem-solving process. It all started with a request by the then Cabinet Secretary, Mr. Suren Singh, uh, made to me saying the metropolitan transport situation in uh, large urban centres in the country, and particularly in Delhi, was getting out of hand. And something needs to be done by the Ministry of Urban Development. In the 1980s, this idea of having a metro for Delhi started. But it kept on uh, being pushed from one table to another because nobody knew which kind of metro, what kind of uh, uh, trains we are going to get, what are the lines we are going to have. Then all that was worked out by the Government of India organization called Rights. Rail India Technical and Economic Services, or RITES, is a Government of India consultancy organization. RITES was taking on a design challenge that 32 earlier reports of various committees could not successfully deliver. One of the reasons so many reports were the, because, as I said, nobody knew the procedure. And everybody who came got a report done. Okay, yes, it has to be done. You do it this way. But nobody sort of looked at it dispassionately as to what is the need of the city and what is the appropriate mode of transport for city. All kinds of buses and light rail transit and high speed tram and so many things were thrown, thrown into it. So after going through all that, uh, preparing a paper for the committee of secretaries, which is usually the step prior to taking the subject to the cabinet for consideration, 
it, it involved that, uh, it involved uh, genuine, genuine hard work, working uh, through late evenings uh, most of the time. And finally, we came out with the paper sometime in 1994, if I remember the date right. And uh, this paper, fortunately for me, was approved as, uh, as it was. Once a prima facie case has been set up, then a feasibility report is done. A feasibility report is something which says, yes, the project is feasible. It arrives at a reasonable cost estimate and the financial profile of the project. And it is done to enable an investment decision. The Wrights team recommended a mass rapid transport system for Delhi. The next step for the two men was to acquire approvals for the project. They knew that any large development project had to pass through a maze of committees and approvals. In pursuance of these approvals, Wrights put together a detailed project report. In the case of Delhi Metro project, we were preparing a project to deal with, a, with the problem of urban mobility. It was not a metro project as such, but that project had to be a part of the overall urban mobility problem of the city. So all the links had to be also planned and taken into account. For example, you see, you, you build a, a metro network. Earlier, the traffic which was moving from the extremities of the town to the middle of the town, center of the town, was moving in one direction. Now what they will do is they'll start going to the nearby station. So the directions change. Are those roads fit enough to take that increased traffic? Can people walk? Are the pedestrian facilities good enough? Can we provide some feeder services from a little further away? So all those factors also we had planned. The initial cost estimate for executing the first two phases of the project in accordance with the DPR was a staggering $1.4 billion. The capital investment was very high, so were the risks in case the project ran into delays and overruns. The Ministry of Finance raised an objection to the proposal, stating that it was not commercially viable. It made the problem for us Herculean, because overruling the Ministry of Finance has never been easy. And they have generally been known to oppose the projects which involve heavy financial outlay, particularly without uh, convincing financial backup. But with the data we had uh, gathered uh, on the study of the recommendations made by various uh, mass urban transportation committees, we were convinced that there was no way in which a metro rail project, particularly in the initial years of its formation, could be made uh, commercially viable. The project would be capital intensive and have a long gestation period. Mr. Singh recognized that getting finance for this project would be critical to making sure it did not fail, like projects before it. I also did one thing because at that time the experience in the country was limited to Calcutta Metro for whatever it was worth. Of course, as they say, people learn from failures. So I had set up a group in Calcutta. The committee in Calcutta found that the Calcutta Metro project had languished for two reasons. One, that it had been starved of funds since it depended on budgetary allocation. And two, that it was regulated under government procedures, a departmental undertaking by the railways. I had the experience at Hong Kong where it was a totally autonomous organization to the extent that they organized their own loans, not with government backing or anything. So I, I said, these two things we must make firm before we launch the project. We worked for the next uh, two or three days uh, on the economic analysis for refurbishing the economic analysis. We had already got carried out in respect of the Delhi Metro Rail project and showed them that in the form of benefits to the general economy, for instance, the reduction of pollution on the roads of Delhi, reduction of congestion, time saving of consumers, reduction of accident rate, and general benefits which will accrue to everybody else apart from the users of the metro. These were uh, substantial benefits which could be converted into monetary values. As luck would have it, the Japan International Cooperation Agency had already shown keen interest in the project. So around 95, uh, we, were, we became aware of this project 
Uh, we are interested because we've been very active in the transport sector, not just in India, but other countries that we operate in. And we're also keen in alleviating uh, the environmental problems of, say, urban centers. And this project ser particularly serves that purpose, and that's why it matches our strategy of uh, uh, how we want to uh, cooperate in the development efforts in uh, countries such as India. And that is where Mr. N. P. Singh pre prepared, I think, nearly 48 financing models. Then, then selected out of that by evaluation criteria and took that up to the cabinet for approval, which included, you know, this Japanese loan, etc. So once an international loan comes in, then the government of India also has to give its share. So that way the finances of the project were tied up. JICA agreed to loan out 60% of the project cost for phase one. The union and state governments would take care of another 28% equitably, along with a subordinate loan of approximately 5% to cover land acquisitions. The remaining 7% would be raised through property development. With regards to the loan, it is made in very soft, uh, what we consider as a very soft conditions, meaning a, a relatively low interest rate, as well as a very long repayment period, which is very uncommon with, say, like commercial borrowings. Uh, to give you an example, the first loan for the phase one project, this was made on the terms of 2.3% per year as interest rate, and then the repayment period extends up to 30 years of which 10 years is what we call grace period, where there is no payment of principal. With the project's financials locked down, another large question loomed. What would be the nature of the organization that would implement this mammoth project? When the organization was being decided at the meeting of the chaired by the cabinet secretary, the two options were considered whether it should be a statutory corporation or should it be a company under the company law. And I think very wisely the cabinet secretary suggested you have a company under company law and in case you find it is not good enough, we can convert it into a statutory corporation. But if you have a statutory corporation, then to undo it is impossible. And finally, on the 3rd of May 1995, Parliament passed an act to form the Delhi Metro Rail Corporation under the Companies Act. The Delhi Metro began commercial operations in 2002. Profitable from day one, it provides the people of Delhi with a state-of-the-art, affordable and comfortable transport alternative. The vision and drive of a few sharp minds has led Delhi to become a city of world-class transportation standards. What was so unique in their thoughts and actions? What are the learnings for all future bureaucrats? It's the tendency of a large number of bureaucrats not to bother about a proposal or a matter, saying, Mera is my interest. That kind of approach does not help. Now, if a proposal is important for your ministry, personally, from your point of view, for the, it will benefit the people at large, well, you must chase the file irrespective of how much time, where it is stuck up. Ultimately, every mega project needs a father at a very high position. And in this case, Mr. N.P. Singh proved to be that. The meeting ground really is that as a political government, political side of it, has to have the vision. And vision can only be translated into reality if the bureaucracy is with you. The existence of Delhi Metro is proof that methodical planning and perseverance by administrators play a vital role in successfully implementing any developmental project in India.